Good morning, church. I invite you to stand with us as we sing and worship our God this morning. your neighbor with the love of Christ this morning.
Well, at this time, I'll invite you to remain standing as you're able. Uh, we're going to profess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed as our guide. Will you please join me? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church. It's so nice to be here worshiping with all of you this morning. If we haven't had the chance to meet yet, uh, my name is Zach. I'm one of the pastors here at Covenant. Welcome to worship. Uh, if you're new to Covenant, I want to offer an especially warm welcome to you. I'm just so glad that you chose to spend your Sunday morning worshiping Jesus with us. Uh, and at this time, I'll invite the ushers to come forward and pass out the offering plates. Uh, at Covenant Church, God has called us to this vision to build a community connecting in Christ, not just within these walls, but outside the walls of the church. And so we do that in a whole bunch of ways, um, but one of those ways is through prayer. Uh, if you're new, in the seat backs in front of you, you'll find two cards, and one of those cards is a prayer card. Uh, church, if you have a prayer that is on your heart, it could be for yourself, for a loved one, it could be for this community or for our country, if you have a joy or a concern, a, a praise or a need, something that you need God to show up in your life in some way, we want to come alongside of you in those prayers. And so you could take that prayer card and you could fill, up, fill out that prayer request. Each and every prayer request gets prayed over every single week, multiple times by our prayer team, our staff, our pastors. And so we really want to come alongside of you in those prayers. The other card says I'm new, and if you are new to Covenant, that card is a great first step. There's a space for some contact information. I would love the privilege to be able to reach out to you, give you a call, shoot you a text, and connect with you. See what it is that brought you here today. See if I can answer any questions for you about the church, and see if our church can meet your family's needs. Uh, those cards, as they're filled out, can be placed in the chest to the left of the doors as you exit the sanctuary this morning. Uh, just a quick invitation for you today. Uh, next Sunday after worship, I am going to Crust Pizza uh, for Pizza with the Pastor. And if you like pizza and you uh, can tolerate pastors, then I'd love for you to join me. Uh, it's a great space for fellowship, to build relationship. It's a great space to ask questions about the church uh, or about anything else that uh, maybe I'll do my best to answer. Um, and really, it's a, space, it's a space for building connection, a space, a way that we build community connecting in Christ. And if you're new and you've been considering, what does it mean to become a member of a church? Uh, this is a great space for that, too. Pizza with the Pastor is a place where we talk about church membership uh, and about what it might mean for you to discern becoming a member of this church. And so if you're free next Sunday for lunch, I'd love to hang out with you over at Crust after service. Uh, well, as we continue in worship this morning, uh, let us go to God for a word of prayer. Oh, Lord, first we just pause and say, uh, we believe that you're here with us. And this morning is not about us. It's not about any of our lesser loves this morning is about glorifying you we want to go vertical this morning we want to lift our hands lift our voices lift our hearts our minds in praise to you so i pray that you would accept our offering of worship in whatever form it takes for each and every one of us and lord as a spirit of intercession we just pray over this community this community of creekside Lord, you know each and every hair on each and every head in this community, in these neighborhoods around us. And we know that you desire good things. You have 
nothing but love for each and every person that you've created in this community. And so we ask, Lord, that you would move in power in Creekside, that your Holy Spirit would wash over us in a, in a wave where we see the gospel go forth and we see it accompanied with power as, as the gospel of the book of Acts says to prove the truth of the good news. And so help us as a church family to be a part of that, to go forth into the community and just to love our neighbor the way that you taught us. And we love you, Lord, but only because you first loved us. And so it's within your great love that we pray. Amen. As always, church is a place of freedom. Feel free to sit or to stand. But let's choose to worship him in spirit and in truth today. Let's sing together. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Cause he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. I still got joy in That makes no sense, so I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength, cause I've built my life on Jesus. He's never let me down, he's faithful in every season. So was 
we continue in worship church I just feel led um, to encourage you that we just sang a song that he won't fail and he's never let me down and some of us in this room uh, may be really annoyed by those lyrics and maybe in a space where we say no it, it does feel like he's let me down and I want to encourage you that God's vision of what's good is so much more expansive than what we can see. And that's where our trust and our faith comes in, that he is good, he is for us, he does have plans to prosper us and not to harm us, to give us hope, to give us a future. And so even if it feels like he's let us down, we trust in faith that he's all-knowing and he can see what we can't. And when we pull back and have a bigger view, we know that in due time, we'll see his goodness and we'll see his plan all along. And so we're gonna continue to sing about his goodness. And as we step into that, if we're in a space where he doesn't feel good, we're going to choose out of trust and out of faith to declare he's good because that's who he is, whether we feel it or not today. We know that he's good. Amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. been held in your hand from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God all my life you have been fed 
All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am in I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire darkest nights you're close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God all my life you have been All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am in I will see the goodness of God oh, Your goodness is running out, it's running out is running out, is running after me, with my life laid down, I surrender now, I give you everything, your goodness is running out, is running after me, your goodness is running out, is running out. We praise you, Lord, and we thank you, God, because you are good. And so we sing of your goodness this morning, Lord, because in all previous trials and tribulations, Lord, you have been faithful and good. And Lord, we ask, we ask, Lord, that you speak to us today, Lord, and that you grant us to be able to see your goodness and your faithfulness for days and days to come. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. All honor and glory to you, Lord. Amen. Church, you may be seated. And my young friends, you're dismissed to head back to Cuff Kids. Have a great time this morning. For those of us remaining in the room, if you have your Bible, I invite you to open it to the Gospel of John. It's the fourth of the four Gospels. If you're turning pages, it's maybe 
80% of the pages of the way through your Bible, and we're reading from chapter 6. So the Gospel of John, chapter 6, and we'll start in verse 47. If you don't have your Bible with you, never fear. The words will be on the screens behind me. This is the word of the Lord. In the words of Jesus, very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Let's bow together for a word of prayer. Father God, what an extraordinary thing it is that we, in this very moment, in this very place, encounter you, that we hear from you, that you speak to us through the through the eternal presence of your word. Lord, I pray that, that you would uh, anoint this space with your Holy Spirit, that we would be gathered in your name but with such clarity and focus that we would receive and understand what you have for us. Lord, open our eyes that we would see. Open our ears that we would hear. Open our minds that we would come to know and understand your word. Open our hearts that we would feel its power. And in response, I pray, O oh Lord, that you would open our hands, that we would offer grace to your people, to your world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to begin where we began the year, actually. Um, this, this season, this year, focusing on what it means for us to be the mirror image of the Lord, comes to us through 2 Corinthians 3.18, and this, this anchors us and has been rooted in us as we journey through now half of the year. Uh, and so, um, in verse 18 of chapter 3, 2 Corinthians, it reads, And we all... Who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, reflect the Lord's glory. We are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. This this transformation into the image of the Lord, this this ever increasing glory that we are reflecting, it's a process of sanctification, of being made holy, of, of, of really adopting our, our original form that we were created in the image and likeness of God that was distorted through the fall and being restored in us through Jesus. And, and so this is a beautiful journey that you and I are on, this work of sanctification. After we profess our faith in Jesus and are justified in him, we then are being sanctified over the course of our lives. Now, sanctification is a pursuit, a pursuit of Jesus, a pursuit of Jesus through the means of grace. 
Means of grace might be an, an interesting or odd term for you. You might not be familiar with it. Means of grace would actually j- just, it would, it would mean what it says, that these are the, the ways in which we access a relationship with Jesus, the ways in which we pursue Jesus and his grace uh, and, and experience, receive that grace. And, and there are many means of grace. You might be able to name them. How are, way, how, what are those ways that we pursue Jesus in a relationship with him? Prayer, the study of the word, through worship, both public and private. And we could go on and on. What it means to be in relational discipleship and accountability. All of these would be means of grace. But, but there are two amongst the means of grace uh, that, that, that really uh, are set apart. These are chief means of grace. Chief means of grace would be uh, ways in which we pursue Jesus where Jesus never fails, will always, every time, without fail, show up. Sometimes whenever we pray, we don't, we don't really understand what's going on or we don't feel God's presence and, and we might feel distant or disconnected. Maybe our hearts aren't in the right posture, but every single time in two chief means of grace, God shows up never fails. It's like this. You remember the movie Tin Cup? Uh, Tin Cup, a great golf movie. Uh, if you haven't seen it, you need to go see it. And, and, and he's, he's having a rough day, as he often does. Uh, the, the, the lead character, he's having a rough day, and he decides that he's going to break every club in his bag right? He's going to break one club and say, I hit that fat, and break another club and say, I'm prone to slice, then break another club and say, I have a hook on that one. He breaks every club, and then he gets to the seven iron, and he says, but the seven iron, I never miss with the seven iron. The seven iron is always true. It always is dependable. It will never fail me. And he played the entire rest of the round with the seven iron because he knew it was dependable. That's like a chief means of grace. You know that it's absolutely dependable that God will show up with grace through Jesus for us every single time. So over the course of the summer, we're going to be working through means of grace We're going to really be pursuing a relationship with Jesus by diving deeply into the means of grace. And today we're starting with one of the chief means of grace, one of the sacraments of the faith, Holy Communion. As you could tell from from, uh, Pastor Zach's reading and and the pursuit of John chapter 6, we are uh, hearing from Jesus what it means for us to, to come together and to eat the bread and drink the wine and understand that it is body and blood of Jesus. But it is a complex and challenging teaching. It's so challenging, in fact, that Jesus lost many disciples over this teaching. We, we didn't read that, that passage, but uh, it extends on in verse 60 and then in verse 66 of John chapter 6. By the way, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be all over John chapter 6 today. So you might want to just keep them open and we're going to work our way. We're going to start at the end, go to the beginning, work our way back towards the end. Okay, So John chapter 6, beginning uh, looking at verse 60 and 66, this is how challenging the teaching that we received is. In verse 60... It it says, on hearing it, many of the disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? So if if you just were were kind of glossed over or thinking about your grocery list or or, or what you have to do in preparation for work tomorrow, or you're going on a trip and you got to pack your luggage and maybe you got to fold some laundry today, or whatever it is was going on in your mind whenever Pastor Zach was reading John chapter 6 earlier, you might have missed the fact that what what Pastor Zach read was super hard, so hard that Jesus lost disciples. In verse 66, it says this, from this time on, Many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Jesus was so clear in such a challenging text that he was willing to lose disciples over it. He wanted wanted the people of God to understand their access, their relationship, and the power had with Jesus. And so 
uh, when we hear this uh, and walk through it, if you find it challenging, if you're wrestling with it today, uh, it, I, I encourage you to stick with it, to, to continue walking. The 12 disciples stayed. They remained with Jesus, remained steadfast. Uh, and, and Jesus knew that, that these would, would journey with them over their ministry. Uh, and so I hope that you'll just stick with it. But we're going to work to see how we can understand this teaching more deeply. Well, the first thing we have to do if we're going to understand where we are uh, in John 6, 47 through 59, is really understand John 6 as a whole. John 6 is a magnificent book of the Bible, and, and it, it, it is uh, very, there's very little that's lost here. Everything has purpose, and it, and it ties together and builds a beautiful arc for us. So uh, we're going to begin by seeing kind of what leads up to, to this passage beginning in verse 47 by looking at the orientation of this chapter. So there are three primary uh, stories. If you see headings in your Bible, you can see it that way. There's the feeding of the 5,000 according to the Gospel of John. And then there is Jesus walking on water. And then there is Jesus' teaching on him being the bread of life. But let's look at how the crowd is moving uh, and, and, and what their purpose and function is here. We could see in John chapter 6, verse 2, that there's a great crowd of people that were following Jesus because they saw the signs that he had performed by healing the sick. So that's the orientation of, of, of relationship, why people were showing up. They witnessed his Healings, and if you look back in your in your Bibles, chapter five talks about a healing at the pool, and and then chapter four talks about healing an official's son, and so these healings that were done in public have this profound impact on the crowd, so much so that they're drawn into relationship with Jesus to see what he would do or to be healed themselves, and so Jesus has this great crowd around him. And they have a very specific purpose, to see the healer, to be in relationship with the healer. Well, well he feeds 5,000 people then. They're, they're gathered around, and, and in John's uh, uh, account of this, uh, he sees the people and, and talks to his disciples about where shall, we, uh, where shall we feed them, how will they have food, and they find a young boy with Five small barley loaves. By the way, I love how John makes sure that they're small barley loaves, not big barley loaves, like small barley loaves. And two, uh, small fish. Again, not large fish. It's not a tuna, okay? It's a small fish. Uh, so five small loaves, two small fish. And Jesus feeds this crowd, 5,000 men. And the response after they witness this magnificent miracle it's it's not only the healings that he can accomplish but now it's the provision that he is able to offer his people in verse 14 it accounts for this sign in this way verse 14 says after the people saw the sign jesus performed uh, they began to say surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world so he's a healer, he's a provider, and now they're ready to, to anoint him. They're ready to, uh, to put him in a position of authority, so much so that it even accounts for, for Jesus' logic. It says that Jesus then looks on them and understands that they want to make him king, that they want to, to put him in power, and he, instead of uh, allowing them to, to anoint him in that way, they then witness that Jesus withdraws. Jesus pulls back, and instead of saying, yes, I am, and letting the crown rest on his head, he pulls back and, with, and withdraws in isolation. I mean, who is this? At the moment where power is going to be granted and conferred, he withdraws? Because that's not the source of his power. He doesn't need that affirmation to acknowledge who he already is. And so the disciples, they're, you know, waiting around for Jesus, twiddling their thumbs, and they decide, okay, we're going to go back to Capernaum. 
Uh, we're going to go back to our home base, the place from which we've been operating in the Galilee, uh, where Peter's family's from, where Peter's mom was healed, and where Jesus had ministry take place already. They're going to go back to Capernaum. So they get in a boat, and they go back to Capernaum. And there, uh, it says three or four miles off the coast. They've been, uh, they've been buffeted by the waves. And here comes Jesus walking on the water. Okay, so this is a, an incredible story, but it, it really uh, is the only aside in the Gospel of John. It's so interesting that for the Gospel of John in chapter 6, the walking on the water is an aside, an independent teaching within a broader teaching. Okay, and, and so then we see the reaction from the crowds at the end of this miracle of walking on water. We see in verse 24, the crowd again. Remember, we're tracking the crowd and understanding what the people are doing in the encounter with Jesus. It says, once the crowd realized, in verse 24, that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. So they were committed. They were all in. Jesus, the healer, Jesus, the provider, they are going to follow him wherever he goes. Don't these people have jobs? Don't they have something to do? Like, don't they have, like, wives and children and husbands? And don't they have something to take care of? They probably have, like, a donkey or a goat or something that needs to be fed. What's up? But instead, nope. Healer, provider, certainly is a prophet. I'm going after him. And so they follow him. They get in their boats. They follow Jesus to Capernaum. And they find Jesus in Capernaum. Verse 25, they found, they found him on the other side of the lake. They said, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus doesn't answer the question. I love this. Jesus is very humble. He's not like, yeah, I walked, I walked here um, uh, on the water, uh, during the storm, in the waves. No, he doesn't say any of that. He gets like right into his teaching. He skips over their question, doesn't address it at all, goes straight into his teaching. And, and, and in verse 26, we really get to see uh, Jesus' understanding of what they were pursuing and how that was different than what he was offering. How often do we pursue Jesus for our own purposes outside of God's purposes? He sees them and understands that they are pursuing him for something other than what he's offering. Verse 26, it reads like this. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you're looking for me not because of the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Jesus says, you like the feeling of provision, of food, of being sustained, and, and, and that's your motivation. You wonder if I'm going to be passing out free meals from now on. Of course you don't have to go to work. You can just come to Jesus and get that food. But Jesus says you're missing the point. You're not seeing what I'm offering. And, and he describes it in this way. He talks about the, the, the necessity uh, to work for this food. And he's offering something extraordinary. He's not offering something that is temporary. Rather, he's offering something that lasts. Verse 27, and then we're, we're going to dig into 27 a little bit and stay there. It says, do not work, this, this is Jesus teaching, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father has placed his seal of approval. Do not work for that which spoils, but work for that which is eternal. And, and, and I, I, I got to say, at first, I get like this prepper's vibe, okay? Like, like I think about like what is the food that's really going to last the longest. And, and I know that you could buy like those canned goods that are supposed to last like 20 years. And if you're really smart, you're just stocking up on Twinkies because they will last through radioactive apocalypse, right? Yes, at least that's the rumor. I believe it because that's, that's good. No Twinkie fans? Oh, come on. Someone, every, I know, see, that's like, the, this is, you, you're like the McDonald's folks. Oh, I don't like McDonald's. I don't eat McDonald's. I would never eat McDonald's. And then McDonald's makes billions of dollars off of who? No one likes it. No one goes there. Like, I mean, that's what you are with Twinkies. I know you. You go to the, the gas station and you're walking through and you see the Twinkie and you're like, oh. And then you grab one. I, okay. So, I mean, 
this totally gives me those prepper vibes, though. Like, this food that lasts what will not spoil. But the reality is there is no food, earthly food, that will actually last, have the longevity that Jesus is talking about. It will all spoil. It would all spoil. But there's only one thing that will last for eternity, and that's what Jesus is offering. And it's entirely distinctive, separate, other, ex- extraordinary. And, and, and it's what we are to learn about and, and really receive and, and adopt. But here's, here's the interesting part. This is baffling. Jesus talks about the fact that you work for food that spoils. But then he says... But now I'm going to have you work for food that will last. And man, that plays wrong for us if we read it out of context. Because immediately you and I are like, okay, what do I have to do? How do I need to perform? What do I need to accomplish? What to-do list do I need to check off? No, none of that. And I'm so thankful to God that he doesn't leave us void in this regard. Whenever Jesus says you're working for food which will last, food that endures for eternal life, then they say, just as we would say in verse 28, well, what must we do to do the work that God requires? And here's what it says. Jesus answers them. In verse 29, Jesus answers them. The work of God is this. To believe in the one he has sent. That's our work. You could work your entire life for things that you can't take with you because they spoil and will not last. But instead, this work, this work for eternity is so very clear and simple and complex. Believe. All you have to do, the singular offering from Jesus is believe. Believe in me. Believe that God sent me. Believe that what I offer is enough. Believe that what I offer sustains, not just for now, not just for tomorrow, but for eternity. That's the work that we're to be about, this work of belief. And and I'm so thankful to God that, that we have the means of grace and the chief means of grace as consistent Available, uh, available offerings of relationship with Jesus so that we might believe. And so uh, then Jesus continues on in this teaching and he, and he lays out this, this nuanced difference, this difference between manna and, and what he offers as the bread of life. We'll get into that a little more in a moment. But then he gives a, a kind of a thesis. I, you know, I, I want to draw a sum, some summary statements in Jesus' teaching. There are two verses in the first half before we arrive at what Pastor Zach read in verse 47 that, that outline all of what Jesus is laying out for us. It's in verse 33 and 35. And then it's echoed again. We'll get to that in a second. But in verse 33, here's what this, what this bread of life is. Verse 33 says, For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. It's, it's bread from heaven, but it gives life to the world. And that's different. You know, th- this manna that we, that we received, uh, that, that the people of God in Exodus in the wilderness received, what was bread from heaven, and they accounted for it as God's provision, their daily bread. But, but it wasn't just, uh, it, it wasn't enough to sustain them for eternity. It was enough for each and every day, uh, as long as they were living. But here we have Jesus drawing a nuanced distinction, says that bread is daily bread, but this bread is eternal bread. It comes from heaven and gives life to the world. And then in verse 35, just in, in case anyone would kind of, was kind of missing the mark, if, if we weren't quite understanding what Jesus was saying, uh, Jesus is so explicit here for us in verse 35. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never grow thirsty. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the gift of God 
in Jesus Christ. That every hunger is satisfied. Every thirst is quenched. So that we now have eternal relationship, satisfaction, life with Jesus. And so all of that is what kind of leads and builds up to, to where we are when we get to verse 47. Uh, and and, and I, I do want to note that verse 47 uh, uh, has an opening statement. It says, very truly I tell you, and in this Jesus teaching uh, of chapter 6 from verse 25 all the way through verse 59, Jesus says four different times, very truly I tell you. Very truly, I tell you. And, and two of those are contained here. Verse 47 says, very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. That sounds really similar to verse 33, right? Verse 33, for the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. These things are intimately connected. And so Jesus is, is teaching in a way where we can understand and grasp. And then in verse 48, it ties into verse 30, uh, 35, where it says, I am the bread of life. By the way, that's one of those Bible verses. Like if you want to memorize a Bible verse, but you like uh, know that you struggle with memory sort of stuff, uh, that's one to do. John chapter 6, verse 48, I am the bread of life, right? We could all get that one. Say it with me. I am the bread of life. See, you did it. There we go. John chapter 6, verse 48. So there we have Jesus reiterating this teaching. But the teaching is so very challenging to hear and to receive, to understand, to grasp. Jesus then teaches on manna again, that it spoils even though it will satisfy for a day, but that Jesus satisfies for eternity. But then I want you to see uh, where the challenge starts to really lay in for the disciples who have come to see him as healer, as provider, as one for whom they can receive teaching from. In verse 51, here's where it turns. I am the living bread that came down from heaven, Jesus says. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now, now we, could, we could read and understand this in the full context of the scripture and understand that Jesus' flesh, his actual body, would hang on the cross. And that as he bled and died, he would take away the sins of the world. And that, that flesh is the offering, the atoning sacrifice that uh, creates space for you and I to be restored in right relationship with God. We could see, but, see that, but we understand that in the moment... Whenever the disciples re received this teaching, this was very challenging. And, and I, I want to note that John, like, he buries the lead on this. Uh, I wish that John would have led, would have, would have opened with this, because it changes the scene a little bit. I hope that, 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 you'll, that you'll understand that everything that we just talked about with regard to what Jesus has been teaching is all in this context. And in verse 59, it says that Jesus said all of this while he was in the synagogue in Capernaum. So he is in a Jewish synagogue teaching everyone that he is the bread of life, that he has come from heaven, that what their ancestors received was nothing compared to what he is now offering. Do you grasp that? This is, the, the scene matters. And so now that we see this scene and we hear that Jesus teaches that his flesh he will give for the life of the world. Man, that's a hard teaching. And in verse 52, the Jews began to argue sharply amongst themselves. These would be Jews in the synagogue, leaders of the synagogue. They began to argue among them, the, themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And that's a reasonable question. And, and I understand, uh, I would understand if Jesus would have like, capitulated a little bit, if he would have like slowed down, pulled the reins, tapped the brakes, done a little bit of something to not push people away in this moment. 
that would have been maybe what I would have done or maybe what you would have done. If you say something really hard and the people around you say, that was really hard to hear, maybe you're like, hey, it's okay. Nope. Jesus doubles down. I mean, I want, to, I want you to think about those moments uh, where, where you have decided, no, this is worth it. I'm going to double down. I'm going to continue to press on, especially when you face some level of hardship. I mean, I'll, you could think even corporately. We, we know of stories where, like, uh, Jeff Bezos buys the Washington Post, and it makes no sense. Like, the Washington Post was a dumpster fire. It was going in the tank. It was, it was underwater. It was losing money quarter after quarter after quarter. And Jeff Bezos says, yeah, 250 mil. I got it. And he, he, he buys it. He says, I'm going to, to double down on this poor investment. Or it's like when, when, when the folks bailed out Elon Musk. Elon Musk had SpaceX in 2008. I don't know if you remember that. In 2008, SpaceX. And he already blew up three rockets. Three. How, I don't, how many millions of dollars were just blown up in the sky? Right, but but here we have uh, some investors coming in, and they're like, you know what? We 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 see evidence one, evidence two, evidence three, chips in, and rocket number four flew, didn't blow up. Uh, I mean, that kind of doubling down mentality. I'm going to continue to press even when it's hard, even when it's stacked against me, even when there's commentary that would say, hey, ease up. Slow down, cash in. No. Jesus doubles down. And, and so far, we've only heard that, that Jesus' body is, is his flesh will give life to the world. His flesh is bread. How can we eat this flesh? But, but Jesus then pushes in, and he then not only talks about body and flesh, now he talks about his blood and that being the drink, the drink that will provide life. And you're like, okay, vampirism, great. I mean, that's, okay, keep pushing, Jesus. And he pushed. He pushed. But, but I want to really hone in on verse 55 for just a second because that's maybe uh, in Jesus' push to advance not only bread of life but also uh, his blood as uh, an atoning sacrifice. Uh, it outlines for us what is done here. So in verse 55, for my flesh is real Food for my blood is real drink. My blood is real drink. My flesh is real food. That word real kind of popped off the page for me. I'm like, okay, what, what does that mean? Does, uh, or, or, uh, uh, like, uh, help me out in understanding this. So I went to the original Greek, uh, and alethes is the, the word. The Greek word is alethes. And Alethes has an interesting definition. Uh, whenever you read the commentaries, it outlines it in this way. It says, Alethes stresses the undeniable reality that something is fully tested. I.e., it will ultimately be shown to be fact. I love that. It, in most places, alethes is actually translated as truth. In the Gospel of John, the writer of the Gospel of John, actually recorded the word alethes 14 times, uh, as many times just in the Gospel of John as in the entire New Testament. So this word had, had meaning and power for the Gospel writer. And he said, alethes, alethes means that, that what Jesus is offering is absolutely dependable. It can be proven, and if you will test it, you will not see failure. It will sustain Life is absolutely available in the bread, and the cup, in the body, in the blood. It is real. It is absolute. It is testable. 
And so we come to Holy Communion, not just today, but, but many times every single year we come to Holy Communion. And, and there are debates on what is communion. And I want you to know who we are and what we believe in, and, and why we have communion, at, at least on a monthly basis. And it's because we believe that Jesus was serious, that this is not just remembrance or not just memorial. It's not just something that we, that we knew happened, and so we, we ritualize it. It rather, it's, it's power, it's dependable, it's sustaining. It's not just memorial and it's not something to be dismissive of. And we're also not Roman Catholic. The Roman Catholics believe in transubstantiation. Transubstantiation, oh, that's a big word. Say it with me, transubstantiation. Y'all are like, hey, I botched that. Yeah, it's okay. Transubstantiation. So transubstantiation is, is, is an understanding of Holy Communion that the bread literally, when blessed, becomes body. And that the blood literally becomes blood when blessed. So, 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 so we have these two uh, uh, normative understandings in Christian culture that, that it literally transforms and that it's mere memory or, uh, or memorial. And so we hold this center space and we hold fast to it. And here's what we believe. We believe that this is the real presence of Christ. That when we gather around the meal, Jesus really, dependably, every time shows up. And that Jesus is ready to offer you grace that you did not know you needed. That, that Jesus is ready to transform you, to bless you, to anoint you, to journey with you, to restore you, to reconcile you, to heal you. Jesus really shows up. This is real presence. We believe that in Holy Communion, Jesus really shows up. Every single time. And it doesn't matter where you are, what you're doing, but it's all about what Jesus is doing and where he is. And he is here. Real presence in Holy Communion. There's one more thing that we believe about Holy Communion that I'm, I'm going to close with. And that is that we believe revival and Holy Communion go hand in hand. That revival and Holy Communion go hand in hand. And that's actually a part of our Methodist origin story. You see, John Wesley looked out upon America and saw a post-revolutionary war America and knew that what they needed was the very real presence of Christ made available to them. And so he did something extraordinary. He said, I'm going to ordain and send so that the people of America could receive the holy meal. He didn't want us to feel as though we were forsaken, abandoned, but rather he provided a way for a holy meal to be made available for all of the American colonies. And revival spread through this land. Revival, a wildfire of it, spread through this land because the very real presence of Christ was made available to the people of God. So where are we? Where are we today? How do we respond to this teaching? The first is that every time we come and receive Holy Communion, I want you to be reminded, I want you to recall that, that the very real presence of Christ is here, available for you today, and that that is dependable. And that through that, through believing in Jesus and receiving this meal, you then have eternal life and we are participating in that great work. And then I also want you to hear these words from John Wesley and let it convict you like it convicts me because it is convicting. The duty, John Wesley writes, of every Christian, the duty of every Christian is to receive the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, as often as you can. This isn't something to take loosely or to miss out on, but rather it 
is something to treasure. And I celebrate that. As I'm able to share communion with you today, or as I'm able to go to your house or to your hospital room or to your hospice bedside and share Holy Communion with you, it is an opportunity to share in the presence of Christ. Let's not miss that opportunity today. Would you pray with me? Lord, we come before you thankful, thankful for, uh, for your teaching, for Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for your teaching that, that, that you would clarify for us that we have eternal life available by believing in you. And so, Lord, we believe. We surrender every other Uh, every other belief, and we focus centrally, solely on who you are, that you are the son of the living God, that you you are the light of the world, that you are the way, the truth, and the life, that we are yours, Lord, we are yours. We believe, and in our belief, we come and we celebrate you and Jesus. We say, meet with us. We know you're meeting with us. Your very real presence is here among us. So we pray, Almighty God, that you would be glorified in our celebration of this Holy Supper. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, in silence, let us confess our sin now before God. Brothers and sisters, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty. You are the creator of heaven and earth, and you formed us in your own image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name, and we join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, Lord, and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight. 
to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. Jesus healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. And by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, Father, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death. You made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always. Real presence in the power of your word, Holy Spirit. We remember the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us when he took the bread. He gave thanks to his Father. And he broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took also the cup. He gave thanks to his father. And he turned to his disciples and gave it to them and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood. It's the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, Lord, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's sacrifice for us as we together proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And so we ask, O oh God, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast together at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. And now, brothers and sisters, with the confidence of being the children of God, let us join together in praying the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would those who are assisting come forward at this time? This morning, church, will receive the sacrament of Holy Communion by means of intinction. You'll come forward with your hands held open, and you'll be given a piece of bread. You'll take that bread, and you'll dip it in the cup and receive the sacrament in this way. We'll also have an offering to the station to your left of the altar if you'd like to receive the sacrament in a pre-contained, pre-packaged wafer and cup, uh, or if you need to receive the sacrament by means of gluten-free, you can come to this station for both of those opportunities. Uh, after receiving the sacrament, you're invited to spend some time at the kneelers in prayer, uh, communing with the Lord with the real presence of Jesus Christ. As you come, I want you to remember that this is not Covenant's table. This is not a global Methodist table. This is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Communion, the real flesh, the real blood that he's invited us to receive. And so all are welcome. Whatever background you're coming from, whatever week you're coming from, whatever morning you're coming from, you're welcome at this table because it's Christ's table. And so will you come at the direction of the ushers?
Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your body. We thank you for your blood and the power that is in communion to know that your presence is with us. We thank you that you are the bread of life. And Lord, I pray that we would live our lives believing that in Jesus' name. And all God's people together declared, amen. That's truth. Amen. Would you stand for the benediction? Lord, we go forth from this place aware of your power, aware of your presence. And so we enter your world to offer your grace. Lord, use us this week. Use us for your glory, honor, and praise. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Peace be with you, brothers and sisters. Thank you.